Hi there, and welcome to another WCET one-on-one -on -one webcast. I'm Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship at WCET. And as many of you know, WICHE, the Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education, is our parent organization. And today we're very fortunate to have one of our long-term WICHE commissioners. He's been with, uh, he's been the, the Washington State Representative, one of the two appointees, for at least 10 years. So we're pleased that Don Bennett has carved out time to be with us today. Don is at the forefront of the COVID spike and he represents Washington and the, the state system there. So Don, go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll jump into this conversation. Well, good, thanks, Megan. Um, glad to be with you this afternoon. As you know, I'm a member of the Witchy Commission for the last uh, 10 years from the state of Washington. In, in my day job, I'm the deputy director at the Washington Student Achievement Council, which is uh, the state of Washington's higher education agency. So we have a uh, responsibility for a variety of programs and activities in support of students in higher education throughout the state, including administering all of our large financial aid programs, the Washington uh, College Savings Programs, and a very other transaction heavy uh, uh, pieces with the higher education community. Great, well thank you so much for being here. I know it's an incredibly busy time for you all. So. It, I had to catch myself because it seems like we've been sort of in reaction mode with um, institutions beginning to close in Washington, and that's only been barely over two weeks. So right. what, what are some of the lessons that you've learned that since you are sort of ground central and more and more institutions are going to start to confront a lot of the, the challenges that Washington is dealing with? Yeah, it's really been something to be here in Washington. We like to be a leader, but not necessarily leading in a pandemic uh, outbreak. As you know, the Seattle area was where one of the first known cases in the United States of uh, this novel coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19 disease, was announced on January 21st. So we're basically two months since the announcement of that first case. And unfortunately here in Washington, we've had 95 deaths to date, um, 1,996, I think, uh, diagnosis of about 28,000 tested. So about 6% of those tested uh, statewide have uh, turned out positive. Um, we've now had a total of 95 deaths statewide, but 75 of those are in the Seattle King County area. And 35 of those are associated with the Life Care Center, that nursing home in Kirkland. So it's been really, that was obviously an epicenter where this thing really took hold and then just demonstrates how quickly things can spread out from there. I, I think for, for us, it's been, you know, kind of a slow ramp up to uh, expecting that it wouldn't be too long before some of the announced measures for school closures and converting to online would start to uh, have impacts on our operations. And so um, we started about, uh, about three weeks ago, I think, in terms of saying a most likely scenario was we would be under some sort of a directive to uh, go to maximum remote work. Started working within our sort of continuity of operations planning context for that. And have you found that most institutions had a decent continuity plan or are they revisiting those and trying to make the yeah. best of what they can in light of um, you know, the, the breadth and depth of the situation? Right, I think it's interesting. I mean, to me, the, the, what's different is normally in our conventional approach to continuity of operations planning, we're, we're preparing for some sort of wide scale natural disaster like earthquakes and floods or storms and in Washington, volcanic eruptions every few years, uh, wildfires or the more property specific things like a building fire, a power failure. Right. Uh, and I think that this is different, right? And, and normally the goal of those continuity plans is to sort of perform only your mission essential functions and whatever your priority of most vital things is. But there's sort of a mantra about your, your purpose is to, to respond or react, to restore your critical functions and then eventually recover to full functional capacity. So some of those principles apply, but this is very different because I think you're trying to, the best you can, maintain all of your functions even though they might be modified somewhat. And so that ability to sift out between what, you know, must we absolutely do and what can we do uh, is kind of feels a little different in this environment. Sure. And what are some of the most important elements of a continuity plan that are really student focused at this point? 
Yeah, well, I think the things we're finding mostly is obviously those schools that already had a very robust online, you know, learning management system and ability to deliver their instruction in an online environment were, were light years ahead of those who were more dependent on more traditional uh, classroom-based instruction. So I think the transition has been obviously easier in those, those campuses that have a, a very robust uh, department that's supporting all their faculty and converting their classes quickly. The other sort of fortune of being right at the end of the winter quarter, most of our schools operate on a quarter system in Washington, a handful are on semesters. And so the winter quarter was just on the last two weeks, basically last week of instruction, a dead week, a finals week kind of time frame. So that ability to, to convert what remaining amount of instruction to online, to facilitate uh, examinations or other end of quarter projects in an online mode, I think was easier than looking ahead another week or two when the spring quarter begins, or certainly for our semester schools that are mid midterm, um, having to make a little more dramatic of a, of a pivot to how do we provide more, in fact, all of our instruction in an online delivery mode. But the student services piece obviously is one that I think has probably been even more challenging, right? How do you maintain some access to services during this environment if you haven't really been delivering that in the same kind of online modality that most of our instruction has at least a mixed mode of delivery. And so again, I think many of our campuses that have been traditionally dependent on walk-in services, over-the-counter services, are having to find some creative solutions, and, and many of them are, um, using Zoom and other things that they weren't using before, creating lobbies where people can wait and come in when uh, available counselors are available. I've heard of a couple of schools being able to do that in their financial aid offices and other places like that. Uh, from our world, obviously, we administer many large financial aid programs mm -hmm. uh, to students in our state, and then those seem to be some of the areas we're spending as much time on trying to make sure that that aid dollar that's directed towards student be able to meet their, not just their educational expenses, but their living expenses during this time uh, can, can continue to flow uninterrupted as much as we can. Right. Yeah, it's just an incredibly challenging time, and I was just reading an article that there's so many tools out there, and it, it's difficult to try and onboard everybody at the same time, but what you need to do is find the right tool that meets meets the job, which is serving students. So if you right, know, and right students, now it's like phone, that, that so. old adage of not letting the perfect, you know, be the enemy of good enough is right. certainly true now. Um, one of the things that's an interesting kind of I don't know if it's an organizational study or leadership study during this time that you're going to get general guidance from above. You're going to get you know, general direction with that principle you said, stay student focused, try to serve your students. Mm -hmm. But in the details, you're going to have to figure things out, be creative, be innovative, try things. This is really where the, you know, begging for forgiveness later is going to probably be better than, you know, looking for permission now. Uh, nobody knows your business better than you and you figure out what thing's going to work for you to deliver what particular program service activity you're engaged in and and recognize we're in very unprecedented times and, and there are no rules for how to get through this. Right. I had a conversation with the president of NASPA, the student affairs professional organization, and we agreed that there will be some creative solutions that come out of this. You know, it's not ideal, but people are willing to be experimental and forgiving. So I think um, it, it is an interesting time. At any point, I, I expect a dog or a kid to go flying by. And, and that's okay. You know, we're all in that same boat. So right. just are doing the best we can. Um, as more institutions are confronting some of the challenges that you dove face first and feet first into a couple of weeks ago, what, what are some of the strategies you recommend that they start exploring? Who needs to be at the table when they start having these conversations about moving online and what student services to keep open if possible? Who all needs to be part of that conversation and what are some of the first key steps? Yeah, well, really, I mean, we're at the state agency, a little far removed from the campus, and that's part of our federated system where you know, individual institutions and their leaders are having to make the decisions that best serve their student population. And so uh, while there's important reasons to reach out to your state partners and figure out if there are any things that we're able to offer to help you, uh, certainly in the 
both public institutions and our independent colleges in our state participate in the financial aid programs. That's been one of our biggest drivers is trying to make sure we're saying, look, we don't want to be any kind of regulatory or bureaucratic impediment to you doing what you need to do to serve your students. Let us know how we can help you. Well, certainly, um, you know, I've got a bit of plug in for the lawyers. I mean, I think the lawyers can be sometimes uh, able to give you the, the no risk option, but right now you need them to be able to give you the option that is consistent with purpose and move forward and again, manage your risks. But at the same time, I think be willing to accept some risk that right now doing the right thing is going to probably be more important than doing the safe thing. Right, and Department of Ed has offered good guidance about this as well. So they're, they're, they're understanding that compliance isn't the most critical thing at this point, the students are. Yeah, one of the other things that offers, we, we've been trying, and I think this is probably true across a variety of people that have different constituencies, different programs, that you're not gonna probably find the comprehensive solution, the answers to all the questions about everything you're dealing with. You're gonna to have to probably look in multiple places for the thing that's most you know, right in front of you. And so we have communications going to financial aid professionals from our financial aid staff. We have communication going to the authorized schools, the degree authorization, private, nonprofit, and mm -hmm. private sector schools that are operating in our state. That, that's the sole lane of communication just at them to basically say, we're gonna relax the, the compliance expectations right now for you to make the adjustments you need to in response to this, this COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, just let us know what they are and we'll help you as, as best we can. Uh, so I think that that idea that, that you're gonna have to continue to seek out information, I mean, it's probably more difficult the farther up the executive leadership line you are trying to put out fires in multiple directions, but it, it probably also goes to you know, relying on your team to, to, to know their business and to let them run. And, and to make sure that they know that you support them in doing that right now. That important leadership message, I think, is every bit as, as critical as the particulars, but to just say you've got their back and as long as you're doing the right thing by students, you know, nobody's gonna come back around and say, you know, boy, I, I missed uh, checking that box or getting that report in on time or any of those kind of things. I think that we all have to adjust our thinking to, that we normally operate in kind of that compliance mindset right. where you know following the rules and doing everything exactly right has to yield to to getting through this together and and making those adaptations that we need to to survive right and even though each state operates very very differently that uh, the the state higher education executive offices probably can offer good support and guidance and recommendations and and also facilitate some conversations that are across state lines because you have much more experience in this than other states have. Well, certainly we're an open resource. If as other states get into this a little deeper and want to know, well, how did you take this on? Like I know one particular we ran into was seeing the Department of Ed's guidance on federal work study kind of prompted the same questions about our own state work study program where we have student employees that are on on-campus jobs and mm -hmm. off-campus jobs in private sector employment and nonprofit organizations. And what happens if they're not able to work because of a business closure, because of a campus moving to online and mm -hmm. those services going down. And so we've tried to provide, you know, guidance and flexibility, actually even uh, drafted and filed on Friday an emergency rule to convert some of that aid from, um, wage subsidy to direct grant aid so that the students would still get the amount of financial aid that they were expecting to receive this year. It doesn't mean they won't be without some impacts, but to the extent we can rapidly, you know, make some changes that we need to, uh, we can certainly do that. We're also kind of getting into some areas that I hadn't really thought about too much, but one of it has to do with the, the field placements and clinical experiences that are components of so many of our healthcare training or education experiences right now with obviously a, a shortage of healthcare workers that existed before this crisis sure. and now it's going to be exacerbated. So we're starting to try to have some conversations about how do we at a high level leadership say we need to solve for this 
and then let the program people at the institutions and the licensure authorities in our Department of Health and the various boards and commissions that oversee these professions kind of work out the particulars in their particular professional study area because I don't think we can afford to let a whole class of graduating nurses and nurse assistants and skilled nursing assistants all you know wait for six months for this to clear mm -hmm. if we can advance them into their field and get them sure. uh, helping with that problem too. Sure, yeah, if you can sort of mitigate some of those bureaucratic levels and then right, it's, right. what better way to learn, right, than just yeah. jump in and- Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you wanting to say put an untrained you know, nurse into a completely unsupervised arena, but if, for example, the, the standard was, you know, one supervising nurse for one nurse mm -hmm. student, can you go to five to one and still accomplish what you need or 10 to one? I don't know the answers. I'm not a you know nurse educator, but I think we need to think that way to to work together to get through these kind of uh, a situation that we're facing. Right, we're starting to see a lot of these creative ideas percolate up, so we'll be compiling those. You know, it's a lot to ask people to stop and reflect right now because right. everyone's right. in co mode. But I think that there's a lot of lessons that we'll be able to glean from this. So. Uh, what I'm hearing from you is communication has been so vital. So what are some of those ways you're managing this yeah. in the midst of social distancing? Right. Well, I, we had some really timely fielding of Office 365 uh, in our <laughs> office. So we're kind of daily learning Microsoft Teams. And while we hadn't got it fully deployed and set up with existing Teams groups, uh, we did a really cursory once through the organization and set up Teams and some recurring meetings groups that way. Um, we're, we're learning to use it for video calls to stay connected with staff. I think just like this medium here of being able to see a face and, and, and see facial expression and mm -hmm. have face-to-face -face contact while we're all isolated from each other is, is becoming really important. And so between that and increasing our number of VPN connections so that people could actually access their files back in the office, I think we're we're managing as as well as we can with the with our footprint at the the Student Achievement Council in Olympia. Right. Well, good. Well, what other advice or guidance do you have for our community out there? Well, I don't know. The only thing I could say right now is listen to public health officials and uh, keep doing whatever they tell us to do because uh, we've all got a a vested interest in seeing this thing through till there is some resumption of what used to be normal. Uh, I think that the main thing for us right now, stay focused on the students. As much as this dislocation is, uh, the, keeping academic progress, you know, keeping you know, some financial pins underneath people to be able to get through that, uh, I, I think we can manage that. I think uh, 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 all the way across the board, higher education has been making these kinds of transitions uh, to, to adapt the technology, to keep doing what we do. Of, of educating the workforce and uh, equipping people for, uh, for life. And I think mm -hmm. while this might be a two or three month or longer period where things are kind of upside down, I think we need to stay focused on the fact that we'll come out the other side of this. And maybe as you suggest, we'll be learning some things in the midst of this that are sustainable way beyond. I think we are finding that ourselves, asking questions about, well, this might really change the way we do our business going forward. Right. Great. Well, I really appreciate that, Don. It's a good reminder. I think we all are kind of mired in getting through what we need to get through in the day. But at, at the end of the day, we're all in this work because of the students. So if we can do what we can to support them and technology, thankfully, is there to support us delivering education to them. So we'll keep doing what we can here at Wichi and WCET. And we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to help inform our community. Great. It's glad to be with you, Megan. Good luck to you and everybody else out there in WCET. Thanks so much.